notice with a lot of my pictures that uh, they're ag oriented. I live on a farm and I'm a fifth generation Iowa farmer. I'm also an ag communicator. I've been doing that as a, a writer and now a book author. Um, run my own business since 2002. So I tell people I was the reluctant photographer. I'm trained as a writer with a little bit of photography training in college, but I've since trained with a professional photographer that works out of the Ames area. And I also tell people I am not an expert photographer, I'm not a pro photographer, but I know some of the tricks to make your pictures better, whether you have a nice uh, fancy camera or whether you are just using a cell phone. So we'll, let's get started and I'm going to walk you through a number of different things to be aware of so that you can literally improve your photos in one minute. I think one of the biggest things to understand about photography is that you don't take great photos. You make great photos by paying attention to details and lighting and posing and all kinds of factors that we will talk about tonight. So just about all the pictures that I will show during the presentation are ones that I have taken, mainly here in Iowa. So hopefully that will give you some inspiration as well. But first, I want to mess with your mind just a little bit. <laughs> so what do you see? Do you see um, something taking shape in this really weird picture? Why don't you see a picture, Craig? <laughs> yeah, it just looks like lots of white with some dark blobs, huh? <laughs> Well, I'll give you a little hint. It's actually a farm animal in there. Well, it could look like a cow up there in the top right corner. Sort of. Yeah. Kind. Uh, yeah. Yep. That's actually what it is. It's a cow. So up in that top right corner, that's part of its ear. And then if you go over to the left, that's the other ear. You'll see a little dark eye there. And down in the middle of the picture, there's a muzzle. I've had people say it looks like everything from a sailboat to I have no idea what it is. <laughs> but the fun little point of this picture is that I want your brain to work a little bit. I want your brain to start to look at the world differently. And one of the things that distinguishes a, a better photographer from an amateur photographer is that the amateur just takes a snapshot of the first thing they see more of a pro photographer thinks about the scene that they're looking at and they analyze it and then they figure out the best way to take the picture. So this is how you start to engage your brain to look at the world a little bit differently. So the first thing any photographer has to do is you have to watch the light and be very aware of the light because it truly will make or break your picture. And I've learned the hard way as a farm photographer, there's many, many times I cannot control the light. And if I were in a studio as a pro photographer, I'd have all the lights and all the, the backdrops, anything I needed to control the light. I can't do that when I'm out on site at some of these farms. So in this set of pictures here, this is over by Harcourt, Iowa, south of Fort Dodge. And the only time the farmer could meet with me was eight in the morning. And I said, okay, that's fine. I'll come over and we'll do a story about your barn. Well, unfortunately, the most interesting part of the barn faced the west. Not a good thing at 8 a.m. when the sun is coming up in the east. So you can see in that first picture, the front of the barn is dark. The guy's face is dark. So that's, we've got a not so good lighting situation. And I can't change the time. I can't change the direction of the barn. So I had to change what I was doing. So I took a few steps in a different direction, kind of off to the side. So I was actually using the barn to kind of block the sun. That helped a little bit. And then I popped on a flash, even though it was a sunny day, I, I popped a flash onto this picture. And you can see what a difference it makes in that after picture. The first one, lots of unpleasant shadows, dark. The other one, the colors pop, his face is lit up. You can clearly read the text on the barn. So even when you're presented with a tricky lighting situation, don't give up. See what you can do, whether physically moving yourself or changing some settings on your camera if you need to go that far to 
make it work. This is also by Fort Dodge. This was an incredibly cold winter day in January and I was driving home and I noticed that the train, the well that green train on the bottom, uh, the sun was setting right at this point and you can see from the bottom picture how cool the train looked. It was just lit up and had all this vibrancy to it. So I pull over and grab my camera and take this picture really quick. And then I thought as I drove down the road, oh, I should take the picture looking back on this very same scene from a different angle just to show you all the difference that lighting makes. So there was no extra lighting that I put on this. It was truly just a, a snap and go because A, I was on the highway and I didn't want to get hit by cars. And B, that time of year, the sun goes down really fast. So sometimes you've only got 30 seconds to get that shot, depending on how fast the sun is setting. So it's just remarkable to me that that is the same elevator, the same train, just a different angle and catching that light just at the right moment. And as one point person pointed out, well, that one, the picture at the bottom that's lit up so nice, that's so cool. You don't even see the graffiti on the train cars. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Can't argue with that. <laughs> Um, sunshine is um, sometimes a blessing and a curse, especially when it comes to taking portraits of people outside. So this is an organic farmer down by Waukee, and I was doing a story on her community-supported agriculture venture, and her name's Jennifer Miller, and we were out at about two in the afternoon, and it was, you can tell in that first picture on the left, really quite bright and sunny, not a lot of clouds in the sky, and it's not a terrible picture, but when you see it compared to the one on the right, you can see that the lighting is quite a bit different. And all I did is I, there were enough clouds in the sky that I was waiting for one to kind of move in front of the sun and act as a natural filter because I didn't have a helper with me. Most of the time I'm working alone. If I had a helper with me, I have a thing called a scrim, which is just like a big pop-up white transparent um, piece of fabric on a circle. You can buy them from photography stores. They will help you block that light so that you get the picture on the right rather than the picture on the left. I didn't have a helper, so I had to let Mother Nature work for me. But the reason you wanted to block that light just a little bit is notice her picture in the left. It's She's got those dark shadows under her eyes and her skin looks kind of dull and weird. Those raccoon eyes, they call them, are because you, you're not lighting her face properly and all the shadows are creeping in there. So just blocking out the really harsh direct light that was shining on her and running that light, in this case through a cloud, which softens the light, it took away the raccoon eyes and gives a much better skin tone. So sometimes it's just a matter of looking for little things like that and letting Mother Nature work for you. The rule of thirds is one of those standard made, you know, you, you got to know the rules before you can break them kind of deals in photography. So if you're not familiar with the rule of thirds, just imagine your frame being a checkerboard. And a lot of cameras, you can actually put on a setting that puts the little grid on your viewfinder frame so you can use what is called these points of power. So where those grid lines are intersecting, you'll see those four red dots there in that picture. Those are called your points of power. You generally want the focus of your picture to be in those points of power. Now, most amateurs think that you want to center your subject perfectly. Sometimes you do, but not normally. It adds more visual interest when you have it set off to the side on those points of power. And I'll show you how this works in real life. So this picture on the left, I took this when I was doing a recipe page uh, in Lake City. I was writing a story about a farm cook and I was featuring her cinnamon rolls. And I decided not only did the cinnamon rolls look fantastic, but I liked the flowers, I liked the coffee cup, I liked the china, but still the star of the show was the cinnamon rolls. So rather than just get in real close on the rolls, I showed the whole scene but if you divide that image into a tic-tac-toe board pattern, you'll notice that the cinnamon rolls fall down on those lower points of power where those grid lines are intersecting. And that's good because it keeps things in balance and it still keeps your focus on the rolls. 
Now, the picture on the right, that's Sarah Pratt. She is the gal who carves the butter, butter cow every year at the state fair. And I was trying to show her at work and she's got her little scalpel in hand working on the eye. And so the focus, we'll talk about this in a bit, but the focus in a picture like this always needs to be on the eye. So in this case, it's the eye of the cow. Now, as I look at that picture today, I see a very glaring error that I should have caught when I was taking it. Notice there's a pipe or that whatever that red line is back there, some sort of a pipe or a bar back there. It's running from the cow right into her nose, it looks like. So <laughs> <laughs> if I had paid a little more attention, I would have repositioned myself so that she, as she's working, I would just shift myself so you wouldn't see that stupid red bar running right into her nose. You could try and take that out with Photoshop. It wouldn't be the hardest thing to do, but it would also be kind of a pain and time consuming. And in my business where I get paid by the hour and clients don't want me horsing around wasting time on their dime, it's like my photography teacher said, get it right in the camera first so you don't have to go back and fix some of that in Photoshop. Because the other myth is that people think you can fix everything in Photoshop or Lightroom, which I actually use Lightroom most of the time. But some stuff just is not fixable. If you screw it up when you take the picture, you really can't salvage it in the software. So just try and, and get it right in the camera. It makes life a lot easier. <laughs> This was one of those happy accidents that I wasn't even trying. I wasn't really thinking about the rule of thirds. I was walking away from a farm up by Lorenz, Iowa, after I finished up and with an interview. And I'm going out to my car, and I look over at this old barn, and there's this cat sitting in the window. And I thought, oh, he's so cute. I hope he doesn't run away. So I hold, grab my camera, pop it up there, get the image. And as I looked at it later, well, here we go, rule of thirds. He's up in the upper left quadrant there. So he's in that upper point of power. And then another happy accident was look at the way that the, um, the stucco on there is actually some of the, the chunk fell out. So you have a triangle there, which makes like a little natural arrow that's a leading line pointing your eye to the cat. So that was <laughs> a happy accident. <laughs> we'll talk about leading lines a little bit more in just a minute but what all these little things that i'm showing you are the little tips and tricks that will help you be able to decode the mystery of why you like some artwork some pictures better than others it's like my photography teacher told me as well once you know how some of these things come together and why good photos work you can recreate that magic many times over going forward. Whereas if you don't understand some of these principles, you'll probably still take some good photos, but it will really be more haphazard and random. And you won't really understand why the photo works so well, and it will be hard to duplicate that. So now once you know the, the tricks behind the curtain, you'll be able to duplicate this frequently. When I uh, did some work for newspapers around here years ago, we had a little training with the newspaper photographer up in Fort Dodge. And one of their words of advice was to zoom in with your feet. So when you think you're close enough to your subject, get a little bit closer, take another step or two, and you will have a better photo. So this interesting little American flag is a very tiny flag. It's one of those that's only about six inches tall, if that. And I was driving over to this little town called Yetter where we deliver our grain. And I, I saw this on a fence post and the neighbor must have put it there some one time. And I always wanted to get this picture of a flag with a cornfield in the background. Notice the, the corn is blurry because I wanted the flag to be the star of the show. But if you just saw this picture, you'd think, oh, wow, that's a big flag probably waving in the breeze. No, it's teeny tiny, but because I got close enough, I zoomed up to that picture, what's tiny becomes the big focus of that picture. And that's the way I wanted it. Now, a lot of you probably know with a smartphone camera, the tricky part about digital zoom is it's kind of crappy. So with my pictures needing to be high resolution so that they can be used in print magazines and print newsletters and things like that for my clients, 
I can't get away with just doing the pinch and zoom on my smartphone camera. I do need to have my DSLR big camera for that because the pinch and zoom time th stuff on a smartphone camera, it, it gets really grainy really fast. So the, the quality is not very good when you do much zooming on a cell phone camera. So just be aware of that. This was my garden right outside my front door um, a few years ago where I had some black eyed Susans and some other flowers that were really looking good and I wanted to take a picture. And the picture on the left is certainly not a horrible picture, but it wasn't quite as interesting as I had hoped it would be. So I thought back to that rule about get closer and really focus the eye on what you want to have your viewer key in on. And it turned out there was a bee flying around that day. So I just went in zooming in on a one of the black eyed Susans. You can even see pollen on the petals there. You can see the glint of the sun shining off that bee's wing. That to me is a much more interesting picture than the one on the left. The left one isn't a horrible picture, but the one on the right is just more compelling. And also that rule of thirds is in play again because the bee and the um, middle of that flower are not smack in the middle of the frame. They're kind of off to the side on one of those points of power. So that works. And then also there's some interesting light and shadow going on in that picture, which light and shadow is a whole class in and of itself, but lots of interesting things going on. We talked just a bit earlier about focus on the eyes. If you do just one thing right when you take a picture of a person or a pet or any type of animal, you want to focus on the eyes. Those have to be sharp. If you screw that up, the picture will be not nearly as nice as you'd like and you may not realize why it's not so good. So focus on the eyes. If you know anything about photography, you probably heard people talk about the golden hours. Well, the golden hours are a real thing. Uh, just to look at the pictures on the right here, that golden hour picture at the top was my neighbor loading grain one morning. I literally stood out on my front step and it was probably seven in the morning and they, it was just beautiful. You had the sun coming up in the east, you had the dust coming off the grain wagon as the grain cart was unloading corn into there. So the, the backlighting from the rising sun adds an element to that dust. It's just, it's beautiful lighting. Then that very same day, you know, you can tell it's harvest by the pictures. So that same day I was over at our farm, I climbed up the grain bin, took a picture of my dad combining. It's just, that's a blah picture. The, it's one of those hazy, boring October days that we have sometimes in Iowa. The, it was the high noon sun. There's just nothing interesting about the lighting at all. So when you see that compared to a golden hours picture that you can catch either at sunrise or at sunset, the comparison is just amazing how much different the sun can be at different times. Same type of thing going on here. It's kind of a, the same ideas with a little bit of um, color wheel art theory going in here. So this is um, a corn, this is our cornfield just to the west of my house. And this was an October day and I was, it was probably about four o'clock in the afternoon. I was out walking the dog by the field and I see this ear of corn and I thought that's really interesting. I really wanna take that picture. And what, what my mind saw was the picture on the right. What my camera saw was the picture on the left. And I thought, mm, come on, I know I can do better than this. What I needed to do was actually squat down and shoot upward at that ear of corn because I needed to get the contrast of that beautiful blue October sky and get the beam of sunlight kind of illuminating the corn I had to squat down a little bit to do that because if I just stood at my normal height, I got the picture on the left. The reason the picture on the right works, talking about color wheel theory, 
It was because you've got contrasting colors there where the yellow plays really nice with that beautiful blue sky. So you've got contrast going on. So sometimes all you have to do is literally just change your position. That was taken with a smartphone because I was out walking the dog. I wasn't taking my big heavy camera with me. So just a simple trick like that made all the difference. This is my backyard. I really like fog because it makes for some interesting pictures. So when you've got foggy days, don't put the camera away. Go out and look for cool pictures that you can take. We talked about the golden hours. Then there's also a thing called the blue hours, which you tend to see them in Iowa a little bit more in the fall and winter months. But it's that time before the sun fully sets. There you can see the moon is coming out. And that sky just on some days gets incredibly blue. Uh, blue is my favorite color. I love the wispy clouds there and the moon. And so you got to act a little quick with some of these things because that lighting won't last forever. So I was on my way, I think, to a photography class in Ames. And I pull off to the side and go on a gravel road, snap this picture. and. And just to show you, we are living in Iowa. I had at least one farmer stop and say, are you okay? You know, you're pulled off to the side of the road here. <laughs> so beware, if you're out there taking the kind of pictures I do, you might have some nice friendly people stop and say, are you okay? And yep, just taking pictures. <laughs> And shoot year round. Uh, winter can be cold and unpleasant sometimes in Iowa, but it can be absolutely beautiful too. I, to me, there's nothing better than those gorgeous days when it's real, and these tend to happen when it's really cold, but you'll get that beautiful blue sky and, and it's not hazy. That's one thing is we don't have the haze from about November to February. We don't have the hazy skies in Iowa. We get those clear, crisp atmospheres. So that makes for some really beautiful contrast pictures between the rich blue of the sky and the white of the snow. And if you get one of those mornings where you've got the amazing crystalline frost and hoar frost and, and ice crystals painting all your trees and buildings like the one on the left, go out and shoot like crazy. Uh, the sun will usually melt that off fairly fast, but it's absolutely beautiful when it lasts. So go shoot those pictures. I like the way the sun plays off the, the blues of the sky. So that picture over on the upper left, uh, it's always interesting to me the way the, the light reflects off the blue sky on those days and it makes your shadows in those snow drifts look blue. So those are always fun. And then the bales down below, I always think when those get snow caps on them, they look like gigantic frosted mini wheats. <laughs> <laughs> and then be aware of how you frame your pictures. Sometimes on the flatlands of Western Iowa out here, I don't have a lot of unique framing opportunities. But this was a case where once again, literally my backyard, I was out and I just pulled in my driveway uh, one September day and the neighbor was combining beans. And I knew he was gonna be in this general vicinity between my two big trees. So I throw the groceries down, grab my camera, run to the backyard and I wait. And I just wait for him to come back and make another round and pull into this area where I can see the beautiful red combine the golden leaves, uh, the beautiful brown of the, the field and the beans. And I just wait for him to get in that right spot in between all those tree branches. And that's an interesting picture to me because most of the time I don't get to frame a combine with trees around it. These are big open fields out here. So I let mother nature be my frame there. The best pictures tell a story too. And one thing you can do when you're working with people is create these environmental shots, these environmental portraits that show what the person's all about. So I interview farmers a lot and I'm on their farms a lot. And so I get to see what makes them tick and what things they like. And I could just have these guys or gals sit at the kitchen table and take a quick picture and that would be good enough for some of my clients, but it's not good enough for me. 
So the guy on the right, for example, he's a horse fanatic. So we went outside and did the picture by the horse barn and you can see some of the horses in the background. You can tell it with just a glance, the guy's a farmer, he's got horses. It tells you so much about him versus just having him sit at the kitchen table and yeah, that's not interesting. The other thing with farmers or anybody that wears a cap, I would just point out with that guy on the right, we don't have tricky shadows going on under the bill of his cap. That's really something to watch out for if you've got a kid with a baseball cap or anybody wearing a cap. On these sunny days, the bill of the cap will create nasty shadows and kind of you'll, you'll lose the eyes or get the raccoon eyes going on with your subject. So I positioned him under the tree for a couple of reasons, not only to show the barn and the horses, but also to act as a natural filter from the bright midday sun, which would have cast harsh shadows under the bill of that cap. But because the tree blocked some of that harsh sun, we were able to manage some of the shadows and keep them off his face. Another example here, this was out by Vail, Iowa. I was doing a story on this young couple getting in the cattle business. We do the interview at the kitchen table, but when it came time for the picture, I said, let's go out to the cow pasture if that's okay. So another example of an environmental portrait helping tell the story of these people. And I'm at co-ops a lot, so these can be, um, uh, it's like, oh man, how do I make a grain bin picture look interesting? It's like the millionth grain bin picture I've taken. And I was doing a feature on this guy over at Liscom, Iowa, which is in central Iowa. He's a grain superintendent, and we were doing a feature story on him. Now, an amateur's instinct would be to put him right smack up against the grain bin because that's just seems to make sense. But if you put him smack up against the grain bin, all you will see is a gray background and you won't see what's really going on. Now, sometimes that's okay. If you don't, if you want just kind of a plain nondescript background, do that. But in this case, I wanted to show the actual grain complex where he spends his days. And so you can see, we literally walked across the road. You can see the highway there behind him we walked across the road so the proportions were right. Because I wanted to show all of him, including his face. I also wanted to show all of those grain bins, which are very big. So just butting him up against a grain bin would not have given you that same effect. So sometimes when it's a big building like a barn, a grain bin, a big house, if you want to show the whole thing, you need to get your subject quite a ways in front of that to make all the proportions right. Talking about doing lots of grain bin photos, um, this was an example out in Nebraska where I thought, oh, I don't need to have one more boring picture just of a side view of a grain bin. How could I show this and make it look more interesting? Because they had invested, the company had invested some money to upgrade this facility. And I thought, well, I think I'll just drive onto the grain dump and see what this place looks like if I look upward. So I did, and there it was a more interesting perspective of all the grain legs, all the components that actually move that grain around the facility. It was more interesting to look at it directly upward than the image we all see when we just drive by on the road. So sometimes you just need to find a different angle. This is true as if you are shooting a picture of children, for example. I'm five foot nine, I'm lots taller than most little kids, so it makes no sense for me to stand at my regular height and think I'm gonna get an interesting picture of a little kid. They would be running around at ground level, uh, right above ground level, so I would need to sit down on the ground, maybe even lay down on the ground and shoot up at them so that it actually looks more like the world as they see it. This is a perfect example of this because this barn is down by Mount Air. It's north of Mount Air, Iowa, way down in Southern Iowa. And the day I drove by, I wanted to take a picture of those chicory flowers, like you can see in the right-hand picture. They're pretty tiny though, when you actually look at them through the camera lens. So I literally laid down on the gravel road, 
and shot up at the chicory flowers. Now I blurred the image of the barn in the background. I wanted the barn in there, but I didn't want it to be the focus of that picture. So just if you're going to lay down on a gravel road in Iowa, just make sure no trucks or tractors are coming down the road. <laughs> then you'll be fine. And then I did do another shot, as you can see with the one at the bottom, that's where I stood up, did the more traditional picture just of the barn itself. Both are fine pictures. It just all depends on the, the look that you're going for. And since we all have digital cameras now rather than film cameras, which I was uh, using way early in my career where you'd have the 36, 24, 12 exposure rolls of film and you didn't want to screw it up, so get it right. Uh, with digital, at least you've got room to move. You can take as many pictures as you need to and get it right. Don't trust the screen. What I mean by that is sometimes I think I've gotten a good picture, but I don't really look at it all that close. And then I get home and maybe the picture's a little blurry or there was some weird detail that I wish I had not included in the picture. If I'd just taken a few more shots of what I was aiming for, I probably would have had a good one rather than just pinning all my hopes on that one that I thought was okay because it looked okay on the screen. So don't be afraid to shoot a lot. This is another barn, the one on the left there, that is, it's just right down the road, actually right across the road from the barn we just looked at. And I need stock images like that sometimes where if, if I'm writing about grain marketing or just, you know, I don't know, it was something about corn, that's a fine average general shot. But if you wanna get a little more artistic and make people look at the world a little bit differently, that picture's not gonna cut it. So I was thinking about one year, I'd like to enter my picture in the Calhoun County Expo. What could I do to make an interesting picture? And so I was out by our cornfield and the corn was about waist high at that point, maybe somewhere between knee high and waist high. And I just went out and I looked at it. And I looked down the corn whorl and I thought, that looks really cool. That's where all the new leaves come out and start unfurling. And so I took a picture shooting down the corn whorl, and that one ended up winning the Best of Show Award one year at our county fair. So once again, it's got a little bit of a rule of thirds going on there, and just an example of a different way to look at the world and encourage others to see things in a new light. Noticing the details is really important. This is where you just need to train your brain to do it. You don't want to take a beautiful picture and then realize that there's a power pole growing right out of someone's head in your picture, or there was some ugly piece of trash in the background that you just didn't notice. Try and look for those little details and get them out of the frame before you take the picture. Um, we don't really have anything bad like that going on in these two pictures. I was uh, really looking for more interesting ways to frame these people and tell a story. So the ones down there on the left, this is more uh, along the lines of the guy was standing by his barn, these environmental portraits. This couple in Sac County, Iowa, were some of the first to have modern grain bins on their farm. So we went out and stood by the grain bins. So there, the story is kind of in the foreground and the background. Now the kid with the pumpkins, he was at a farmer's market in Carroll, and I just love the, the idea of those beautiful, vibrant orange pumpkins. So rather than get in real tight on him, I used details to work for me to tell this farmer's market story where the, I used the, a wider shot, more of the pumpkins in the foreground, to add visual interest. So just notice those details, make them work for you as you figure out how you want to frame that picture to tell your story. Mm -hmm. I do some food photography too because um, some of my books and writings are more about food writing and so I've had to learn how to do my own food photography. This is not one of my pictures but it's a good teaching tool about the power of details. So we've got some sort of a creamy, maybe a squash bisque or something going on here. 
The picture on the left has some fresh cracked black pepper on there, maybe some red pepper, some herbs. The bowl on the right, it doesn't have any garnish. Um, it's not that there's a right or wrong here. I just think the picture on the left is a little more interesting and more appetizing because someone took the time to add those little garnishes. So sometimes you can add details to make your picture more interesting. Um, in this case, this is also not my picture, but I liked how they did this. They shot it from above and they were using different cups like um, little metal dishes, clear glass dishes, um, muffin cups, uh, different things just to, to show off the food ingredients in a new way. It was just, it made it interesting because of the diversity there. Different sizes, different textures. These are pictures I have taken this summer. Um, one of the things an artist will tell you is that grouping subjects in odd numbers works in art because it just makes it a little easier for your eye to move through the picture. And it's uh, just, it adds a little more dynamic interest to a picture. So for example, this was the picture on the left is a coffee company down by Winterset. I was just there two days ago. And we set up that shot because the guy who's the coffee roaster was nervous and didn't want to be in the picture, but I wanted to show his product and show his coffee roaster. So I had free reign to use as many of his products as I wanted. So I decided five was a good number there. We, to, to pop up the little coffee packs in the back, we actually laid down two other coffee packs to make little risers for those. But the five is a more interesting arrangement than if you had just had two of those in there or four of those in there. You see you've got some balance going on there and it just it just works. And then we also use the coffee beans in the scoop as a little prop in front and we spilled some of the beans out of the scoop deliberately just to add a touch more visual interest. The bins on the right, obviously I can do nothing to add or to, to add or subtract bins, grain bins to the picture, but it's nice that there were three of them. It's a nice balance. And as I lined myself up on the road to take that picture, you'll notice there's a power pole in between the silver or the white bin and the red bin. So rather than have that bin grow or power pole growing out of the red bin, for example, or the white bin, I just slowly drove the car along until we got that power pole right in the middle of those two bins because I didn't want it to be the star of the show rather than the bins. So sometimes it, paying attention to the details is literally that simple that you just drive your car along the road slowly till you get that power pole lining up visually where you want it. We talked just a little bit earlier, I mentioned leading lines on one of those pictures. This is an example of a leading line. This was at the Crawford County Fair a few years ago. I was covering the sheep show and you can see that we've got this interesting kind of angled line going on here where the kids legs are stretched out, the sheep are kind of making this diagonal line as well. And because I wanted the, to, the, the viewer to be able to see Crawford County. If you look between that girl and the guy on the right, you can see that it says Crawford County, so we know where we are. Sometimes you might want to cover that up for whatever reason, then you'll just need to move yourself around to a different place in the picture. In this case, I wanted the viewer to see it, so I positioned myself so all the way, the, the way the kids are lined up, the way the sheep are lined up, all kind of draws your eye to that particular part of the picture. Leading lines also add a sense of motion and energy to a picture. So this picture on the left, I really like wavy, curvy lines. That's just that's Prairie Creek right down the, the way from me, just literally right down the road. That won a conservation um, contest, photo, photo contest at the Clay County Fair a few years ago. Uh, the picture on the right is a grocer in a little town east of me called Dayton, Iowa. The community had lost their grocery store and then this guy was able to reopen it. So I was, the feature was about him, but I thought what a cool opportunity to use the leading lines of the produce case there and the lighting up above those bars of light to 
all point to the guy who is the subject of the story. So it's a leading line that also fits in with that rule of thirds and also with the environmental portrait concept because here he was in his natural environment, which is working in the grocery store. Sometimes you just need to do something as ridiculously simple as tilting your camera to add a little bit more visual interest. So this was about a quarter of a mile away from me. The neighbors had baled these straw or um, corn stalk bales in the fall. And I really like the big round bales. Notice they're in groups of three. We talked about how odd numbers are interesting, threes, fives, sevens. So we've got groups of three here. And the bales themselves are just kind of cool. But the picture on the left, on one of those kind of cloudy, boring days, that's not what my mind was seeing when I saw this in real life. So I, the picture on the right, I literally just tilted my camera at an angle just a little bit. We didn't want it to be so extreme that it looked like the racks were crazy, pointed up in the air and the bales were going to roll off. But you can tell it's got just a slight angle upward to it rather than the flat straight on of the left. And then I also did take that particular picture through Lightroom and did a little bit of brightening, a little bit of color saturation. I don't believe in altering photos too much because I'm more interested in a realistic picture rather than a really artsy picture. That's just a personal choice. But sometimes it's just those little changes that make a big difference. Curves are also worth looking at because the human eye and the brain just have a real thing about wanting to follow those curves and see what's around the curve. It's a mystery. We want to solve the mystery. Where's that curvy line go? So this was a driveway out in Nebraska. And even though it was a, just a cruddy day, you can see the, the lighting is boring. It's just a cloudy, overcast, dull day. That picture is still interesting because of the way I position myself at the end of the driveway, your eye can't help but follow that curve. The bonus tips here at the end, I know this is a lot of stuff to think about, but sometimes we also need to prepare for what's called the decisive moment. So this is when you've got motion in your pictures. This is a guy that knows how to grow soybeans. That, Pot, that stem is just loaded with soybean pods. So what I was trying to do was I was writing a feature on him, but I needed to get a picture of him talking in front of this group of farmers. And if you've ever had your picture taken when you're talking, most of the time you look ridiculous because your mouth is hanging open weird or you're making a weird face because that little split second capture with the camera might catch you in an unflattering pose. It's just, it's how it is when you're talking. So I had to kind of anticipate when he might pause a little bit rather than having his jaw hanging wide open. Um, some of these you just have to take an, an awful lot of pictures so you can find one where the person looks nice rather than look silly. So be prepared, take a lot of pictures, and you will get a good one. Same thing when you're taking pictures of little kids. This was a story about some farm books that had been donated to the local library. And this little guy was in there looking at the books. Um, I wanted it to be uh, like the one on the left. I wanted his grandma smiling and I wanted him engaged in a book. It took a long time before all that came together. But so sometimes you just have to be patient. You have to wait for that decisive moment, take a lot of pictures, but you will get there. And with toddlers, uh, it can be very interesting because they don't really respond to what you want them to do sometimes, so you just have to wait them out. This was down at the Iowa State Fair a few years ago. I probably spent 30 minutes sitting there waiting for this shot because um, you, it just, I can't coach those people. I'm just trying to be a silent observer, and I wanted to catch pictures of moms and kids having fun in the mist there, and just seemed like picture after picture I just wasn't getting what I was looking for so sometimes it's just patience once again and taking a lot of pictures to get the one that you want. The sky is amazing in this picture. This is 
uh, probably about five minutes away from my house and we were I, my mom and dad had had their anniversary dinner that night and we were coming back home and I saw this picture and I said to my dad stop the car immediately I have to take this picture and he was mad but he he did it and I'm so glad he did because it's one of those beautiful late June summer evening skies where you, this is not Photoshop, this is not enhanced, this is just what the sky looked like that night. You had to be in the right place at the right time, but you had to work fast and get that picture. And I'm so glad I did. So isn't that cool? So when you have those opportunities, do not think, oh, I'll just go back and get it later because more often than not, there is no later, unfortunately. And the best photos also have a knack for conveying emotion. They don't just tell a story or capture a moment. They capture emotion. And how do they do that? Well, part of this magical picture here is the fact that she is petting that big pig named Highway. <laughs> so <laughs> Highway was a little pig who had fallen off a transport truck in western Iowa on Highway 20. And this gal runs a dog rescue and she, she's kind of the local helping animals of all types. And so the, some good um, Samaritans driving down the road saw this poor little pig fall off the truck. They took it, they picked it up, took it to a vet clinic. The vet clinic calls this gal and said, would you take in this little wayward piglet? So she did. And now that pig is a big pig who lives on her farm and runs all over the place and is a, such a gentle <laughs> animal. But you can just see the love between that owner and Highway, the pig. And it's because not only is she smiling, but she's physically touching that animal. So sometimes just something as simple as showing human touch conveys emotion. Same type of deal going on with this picture. Uh, I, I was working up in Fort Dodge at a place called Friendship Haven, which is a retirement community. And I was tasked with taking pictures at this little afternoon uh, coffee party. And I looked over and I saw this, this couple, he gives her a kiss and I thought, oh, that's so cute. Oh my gosh. But I wasn't quick enough to get the picture. So I went over to him and explained who I was and why I was taking pictures. And I said, would you be so kind as to recreate what you just did? Would you kiss her on the forehead again? And he laughed. And, and then I found out the reason he was so willing to redo the picture. They're newlyweds. They had just got <laughs> married in the last six months. Wow. Isn't that cool? So yeah, it worked out great that they played along. We recreated the picture. So sometimes don't worry about it. Even if you don't catch it the first time, sometimes you can recreate the picture and there's so much emotion and love. You can just feel the love in that picture. Hands. Um, sometimes if you get those people that are just really nervous about having their picture taken for whatever reason, they will let you take a picture of their hands, if not their face. And these are a couple farmers in Nebraska shaking hands. If you look at the fingernails, you can tell these are not bankers' hands. These are working man's hands. And that's a picture I've used a lot to, uh, like if I'm writing an article about trust or building a business with a partner, whatever it is, something that's trying to convey trust, that's the kind of picture that you want. Sometimes you can put words with your pictures, make uh, your own little cool motivational posters and, and whatnot just by layering some text on the pictures that you take. Not every picture works well for that, but you can also learn to kind of train your eye. If you see a scene that you like and you think you might want to put some text on that at some point, make sure you've got some of those areas that are a little bit more plain, like the one on the left that the, where the field and the road just kind of fades to black. You can actually read the text there. If I'd put the text up on the clouds, it would have been harder to read. So you, you do need some of those blank places calm places in your picture where you can layer text if you want to do that. This was at that same uh, retirement part or retirement community event where I was taking pictures and the picture on the left there is kind of your standard 
shot where it's not it's okay it's not that great but you know I thought how could I do better so I turned my attention to the other side of the room and I saw this lady who had just done cheers with her glass of tea with her neighbor and once again I asked her if I could have her recreate the picture if she'd hold up her glass and she did and to me I like the picture on the right better just because we've cut out a lot of the busy stuff that's going on. There, there's a lot of stuff going on in that picture on the left. And your eye isn't quite sure where to look. You're not quite sure where the focus really is. But with the gal on the right, we're looking at her eyes. We're looking at that happy face. We've got the background blurred. There's just a lot less going on in the background. It's just easier for the eye to focus. So to me, the less is more applies there. Simplicity. Another example of simplicity here, that was at that same co-op where the guy was across the street in front of the grain bins. Um, I just like the look of this mountain of corn that was by this place and we I put the scoop shovel in there and it's just kind of, it's more of an artsy picture but the reason it works is because it's such a simple picture. Once again, rule of thirds going on there as well. This is a cell phone picture. This is from a few years ago when my dad and brother were out checking the crops as the sun's going down. And it, it, this was not something that just spontaneously happened, but I knew we could do it and make it look fairly spontaneous. So I needed to have them get repositioned just a little bit. I wanted to do a silhouette. I want, so I needed my brother, I, I said, freeze you guys, stay where you're at. But then my brother Jason on the left, I said, I need you to move over a few steps to the right because we need you to block that sun. But I still want a hint of the sunlight peeking around your arm there. And then I had my dad just kind of look off into the west. I told my brother, maybe point your finger, do something that it looks like you're having this conversation and you're pointing at something. And that's how simple it is to take a silhouette picture. And that's one of my favorite pictures. So the big thing I think that you're probably getting the hang of is that with any of this, it, it does take some planning. It's not just grab a camera and start shooting madly at the first few things you see that catch your eye. Um, have some thoughts in mind of how you want to capture, make a great picture, not just take pictures. Have your batteries charged up, whether it's your cell phone or your fancier camera. If you have one, make sure you've got enough memory because I shoot high resolution pictures since so many of them are going into print applications where you need the high resolution pictures. Make sure you've got the capacity for that. Have fun, keep learning. And just like my Amish buggy down there, I love the fact that they'd hitched up at the Dollar General sign. And uh, that was one where I needed to have my, it was just, I didn't know they, the guy was gonna pull in with his buggy. So grab that camera. I had fully charged batteries and enough memory cards to go. So there we go. You catch some of these pictures. <laughs> so remember, you don't take great photos, you make great photos. And if you'd like to see more of my work, you can see some of it at my website. Uh, follow me on Facebook, Twitter. Um, I post a lot of my pictures out there. And you can learn more about my books on my website too. A lot of these images uh, turn up in my books like Culinary History of Iowa. My latest book is Iowa's Ag History. So Check it out, and I hope this has been helpful for you. And if anybody has any questions, I will certainly do my best to answer them. Darcy, thank you for joining us. That was a fantastic presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Um, Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, everyone can um, turn on their mics and ask a question, or you can use the chat feature and type your question in the box if you'd rather. Thanks, Darcy. I love to, to uh, watch your pictures of your cats on Facebook. Oh, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Lois. Those cats are always doing something crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Darcy, I enjoyed hearing all the different places because I grew up north of Fort Dodge. So, oh, well, awesome. So yeah, so 
I'm Pip, you know, family in Sac City and, and that area, so very familiar. So thanks for sharing. Well, you're welcome. You bet. A question just came in the chat. Um, yes. It says, do you have any tips on how to focus in on a person's eyes? Yes. So if you're using a cell phone camera, just aim your, um, just um, aim the camera at their eyes and it should autofocus pretty well for you. Um, on the more fancy DSLR cameras, you can set different ways for the camera to focus. Um, take a look at your instruction book on that and the main thing is just wherever that camera lens where you know that it focuses, point that at the eyes. You don't want to point, like in the picture of me, let's say on the screen there with the tractor, you wouldn't want to be having that focal point over by the tractor tire because then it'll put that in focus and maybe throw the rest of the picture out of focus. So you'd want to zoom in on my eyes and then uh, if you get into the fancier, uh, the more complex, oh. excuse me, photography where you are actually um, setting aperture stops, um, you'll want to, uh, well, for example, if you want to have everything in focus, then you want to go to the higher levels like an f-stop of 13, 16, stuff like that. If you want to have the eyes in focus but throw the rest of the background into more of a blurry background, you'll want to set it at the lower f-stops, like a 2.8, 3.5. Um, smartphones will just do that automatically pretty decently if you just take a, uh, just use the standard settings. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Just point your lens at the eyes and you'll be on the right track. Really enjoyed it, uh, Darcy. Very informative and uh, clear instructions. Well, thank you. I, you know, it, a lot of this is hard won field tested knowledge because for the longest time I, I couldn't find a good photography teacher. The photography books I would read were either way over my head or they just didn't make sense to me. And yeah, it, it, a lot of this stuff isn't that hard when you have someone explain it to you clearly, but for whatever reason, there's not a lot of good resources out there that explain it clearly. So I'm really glad it was helpful for you.